Okay, a bit slow on this uh, our bot manager video. I think it's been a month or so since I did the last one. Uh, I was being distracted. I had to re-implement my NAS. Uh, my old one was breaking down, so I had to put in a Synology a NAS. So I actually did a video on that. And also been working on my front door, and it's summer now, and uh, I've been getting out on my boat. So probably a slower pace on robotics than uh, over winter. But I think I'm in good shape now to start implementing SLAM or simultaneous uh, uh, location and mapping uh, algorithms. Uh, but before I do that, I had to do some calibration on the robot. I needed to make sure that I could uh, send the robot and have it report back on exact distances and meters and uh, uh, pose information and uh, or the direction is pointing in radians or degrees so the rest of this video is mostly about th that calibration and then I have a quick look at SLAM and then I think I'm all set to actually implement SLAM in the, the next series of videos. I wanted to learn a bit more about power usage on my robot uh, so I took uh, power usage uh, going into my robot on the 12 volt rail and also did a current me measurement coming out of the 12 volt to 5 volt adapter. So current on the 12 volt li line was close to f half an amp and then when I measured the current coming out of the 12 volt to 5 volt adapter it's almost one amp so almost double. So the difference is kind of expected uh, but it just means I have to be careful that uh, I'm aware of the actual current being drawn on the 5 volt li line because that's where most of the current is going to be used. Uh, it's still under about 1.5 amps which is kind of my target uh, even with the LiDAR running. Uh, so I've got about half an amp free on the 5 volt line I can still use. So calibrating my robot. So I've set up a 2 meter run here starting from a piece of masking tape there and going up to this one which is set at 2 meters. So I had to change the code in my base motor controller so I ne needed to add in a conversion factor uh, because the base motor controller measures everything in an encoder ticks or number of ticks uh, that the motor goes round. Um, I had to put in a, some sort of ratio where I could feed it a distance in, in meters or millimeters in my case and uh, have it convert to the number of ticks. So this distance tick ratio which is a global variable is the value book that I worked out to convert encoder uh, ticks to millimeters. Um, and then I take that when I do a, a run distance here. And I basically multiply the distance I entered by the, the, the ratio here, distance tick ratio. And so that gives me the number of encoded ticks that it expects to move that uh, that distance. Uh, so I did a number of tests and I, I'm getting pretty close to uh, being enter, enter in the number of uh, or the distance, uh, 2 meters or 2,000 millimeters in my case, and checking that the base actually moves that, that distance. Let's have a look at that. Okay, let's uh, try moving two meters. So I did a BMC, base motor controller, run distance, and I'm telling it to go 100% speed uh, for, in this case, 2,000 uh, millimeters or two meters. See how close we get. Hey, that's looking pretty good. I'm just about right on the two meter point for the masking tape maybe a few millimeters difference but I'm not going to sweat it uh, so let's try getting the the turn distance working as well so I should be able to enter a number of radians or degrees I haven't decided which yet and have the base turn uh, that many degrees okay setting up the code to rotate a certain number of de degrees I decided to use degrees so 180 degrees should do half a rotation so same thing here, I added this uh, global variable distance turn tick ratio, so number of ticks the encoder should report on to turn a, a certain number of uh, t 
turn one degree. Uh, so same thing down here in uh, turn distance. I just multiply the distance that I entered, so distance in degrees. By that turn distance, turn uh, tick ratio setting to find out the number of ticks that I expect it to actually move. Uh, so let's try it out. We do base motor controller, turn distance. I'll do it at 100% speed and do 180 degrees. Okay, that looks pretty close and this one's not going to be too exact. I found that my motors don't really cope with uh, turning the base that well. I probably need a more torque. Maybe I need a more geared down motor to do this properly. But let's try going back the other direction. Uh, you can see where it's uh, gone out a little bit. And let's try just 90 degrees. Okay, so that looks like it's doing the right thing. So uh, moving a distance and turning a distance, especially turning the distance isn't 100% accurate, but it's going to be close enough for what I want to do. So I got a little interested here. I was wondering why it seemed to be hard to, or harder to uh, turn a distance than run a distance. It just seems uh, the motors weren't working as well when I was doing turns versus uh, running the robot. Uh, so you here, see here's an experiment where I was getting the robot to turn. I was using the joystick in this case on carpet. And you can see it's a bit jittery sometimes. It's a bit hard starting off. And didn't seem to turn as fast either. And then I did the same thing with the joystick on a, a wood floor. So a lot less friction on the on the tracks. Here you see it both turns faster and it's a lot more responsive. I found the joystick uh, I could go slower speeds and it'd still respond to the turns correctly. Uh, and I think this is something to do with f friction. So I started looking on the web about uh, about uh, tracked robots to see what might be causing the problem. So I found there's uh, with tracked robots or tanks like I've got uh, there's extra forces that get applied when you're turning the, the track. So in this case it just shows the two tracks. When I'm going backwards and forwards it's, it really doesn't run into any other friction than the tracks moving forwards and backwards. But when you're doing a turn, so I do a turn by having the tracks move in opposite directions, you see there's lateral forces that get applied as it moves over the surface. So basically it's doing a skid over whatever surface it's on to as part of the, the turn. So uh, sideways to the track and that's called skid friction and I found uh, depending on the surface that my tanks running on it's either can turn more smoothly or has more friction so it has trouble turning um, so that's really the, the problem I'm, I'm running into with turning a distance is being able to uh, set the speed uh, to something where friction doesn't really uh, 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 throw out the the ability for the the tracks to to turn. I'm not going to do anything about it. Uh, I'm basically going to do turns at a hundred percent speed, which seems to work on carpet and on uh, on surfaces like wood floors. Um, but it's something I need to keep awareness of, and I think the only way to fix it would be to have more torque on the motors, so either gear them down. Um, or uh, run them on something with less friction like a wooden floor all the time but uh, again because uh, the actual location and uh, orientation of the robot is not just dependent on the uh, theoretical command uh, velocity commands I give to the base uh, it's no big deal in the end as long as the robot can turn as my robot navigates around the environment, it's going to be mapping the environment at the same time. Part of the mapping process, uh, which I'll talk about later, is it needs to get uh, good odometry or uh, positional information coming back from the base as it moves around. Uh, so it can uh, correlate that with LiDAR uh, information and any other sensors it has for location to actually build up a map. So I'm going to do some tests where I navigate the robot around, look at the pose information and make sure it correlates with actual location of the robot base. 
So I'm going to navigate my robot around just in a little triangular track and it should get back to where it started. At least it, the pose information should say it's back to where it started. So first let's start up the base motor controller and this is going to report on angles and poses and things and I'm going to use my joystick to try and move this. So let's go forward and make it first. Uh, basically up to the first stop that looks like a meter now I'm going to turn it 90 degrees which is uh, is about 1.57 radians Okay, <laughs> close enough. Now we'll go forward another meter. Okay, so it looks good. Uh, it's reporting that it's uh, one meter in the x direction, one meter in the y direction. Now we're going to turn it uh, to come back to the starting point, and it's going to need to turn about 225 degrees relative to where it's starting uh, which is about 3.95 radians so let's try turning it that far okay that's about as close as I can get and hit it back to the starting point and we can see here really the wasn't quite the right angle coming back but it does show that the X and Y points are pretty close to the to zero uh, not that close this X at least is pretty close and Y is getting pretty close and the robot's near where it started so uh, that's probably as good as I'm going to get with the odometry off the off the um, encoders on the motors on the base yeah, yeah should have everything set up now to uh, implement SLAM or simultaneous localization and mapping uh, so I've got odometry information coming back from the base it's not 100% exact but uh, SLAM uses that in combination with other information to actually work out where the robots located or the localization of the robot um, so for this and I'll be going over most of this in the next video so I'll be using the ROS2 SLAM toolbox um, and I'll put a link here to the the actual toolbox on GitHub uh, also in the toolbox box information there's a link to uh, Steve McKensky's uh, discussion at ROSCon 19 about using the toolbox and this is a ROS2 toolbox. Um, first time I watched that it didn't make much sense to me but further down there's another video I've got here which is kind of an introduction to SLAM. I'd say right, watch that one first and then it makes more sense what Steve's talking about up here. Uh, Part of what's in the SLAM toolbox, it includes a sensor matcher, a pose graph uh, uh, engine, a loop closure candidate selector, and graph optimizer. And again, you probably need to read this or watch this YouTube first before any of these make any sense. Um, so I'm going to try setting that up. Uh, initially, I'll just use the odometry coming from my uh, base that we just saw getting set up and it's probably accurate enough for this and LiDAR information coming from the LiDAR that we saw set up in the previous video and hopefully out of that I can navigate the robot around and have it automatically produce a map uh, and the SLAM toolbox will uh, optimize the map so it actually looks like a map and has distances that match the environment that I'm, I'm mapping. Uh, as I go along, I may add some other sensors to help with the, the mapping. So one thought is add a, what's called a 9-axis sensor, so basically a combination of gyroscope, accelerometer, and magne uh, magnetometer, uh, so it can uh, 
find its ap absolute uh, uh, pose with the gyroscope. You can see, uh, get an idea of how it's moving with the accelerometer and the magnetometer. Uh, can uh, do things like uh, determine what directions it's it's facing. These can be a bit uh, iffy too. If you've got magnetic stuff in the house, then I may throw those out. So I may try that, I may not. Uh, the other thing I thought of adding would be some line following. So maybe you have a camera pointing down to do some line following so that the base can find out more accurately or determine more accurately where it's actually located based on where it is on the line. Uh, or the other thought is to uh, just have landmarks, uh, maybe a, like a sticky note with a barcode or a pointer on it. And again, the, as the base goes around, if it goes over one of these uh, landmarks, then it can reset its odometry information to uh, make sure it's got uh, best un understanding of where it is in the in the real world periodically, and they'll help to... Uh, uh, perform the mapping operation. Uh, if you haven't told, uh, realized so far, I don't know what I'm doing uh, with SLAM. First time I've looked at it. So it may take me some time to work through this. Uh, so you're going to see some re rework as I go around doing this. You've already seen that in this video where I'm uh, having to calibrate the base and do some rework on the motor controller um, to make sure it's reporting the back the correct distances. Um, there's probably going to be other things that I need to rework as I go along as well. And uh, with SLAM, this is all new stuff to me, so a lot of learning needed. Uh, so I've been using YouTube videos, reading experimentation to learn more about SLAM. And like I said, this SLAM intro here in YouTube was a really good uh, video to get started with. And my end goals for getting SLAM in implemented will be uh, to be able to interactively develop maps when exploring the env environment under joystick control so I should be able to use the joystick have the robot go around my environment and have a map come out the end of that that I can use later on for uh, doing actual uh, navigation with the robot uh, I want it to make sure it can re accurately report the location so once the maps are in place and it, uh, it's using odometry that should be able to much better uh, understand where it is at any time so the robot I should be able to query it and ask where it is and also just for me get a better understanding of what SLAM and the SLAM toolkit's all about so I'll be studying uh, the actual SLAM impl implementation in the next video